So here's the difference between a click and a chirp. In a click, all the frequencies are applied to the cochlea at once. Some of them have, part of them, lower frequency components have to travel further. Higher frequency components travel less. And we get what we get as far as an asynchronous or a dyssynchronous firing. Okay? Um, look at that compared to the chirp. Now, this axis, um, the x-axis here, is a, um, an axis of time. Notice that the high frequencies uh, are here, mid frequencies, low frequencies. So we actually apply the low frequencies first, and then some higher frequencies, mid frequencies, higher frequencies, and even higher frequencies, and apply those last. All right. So, since the low frequencies go in first, they are given time to travel to their destination before the next set of frequencies, the next set, the next set, and then the highest, which requires the least amount of time. I have here a simulation that is going to make this clear how it works. Okay? So just watch this. I'll get this going. Tell it to run, and then expand it so you can see it. Uh, and this is the perfect way to show it. All right. Right now, we're showing what happens when a click, that's all frequencies, simultaneously enter the cochlea. Okay. This represents the bezel membrane all right, from the uh, uh, base to the apex. And uh, these represent the auditory nervous system uh, finally arriving at the site that produces uh, wave fought inferior colliculus. Okay? So watch what happens here. As we start applying, uh, as, as we start, oh, wrong thing. As we start applying the stimulus, we're applying a click now, you see? And so all frequencies are presented to the cochlea at once. Uh, now the high frequency has already arrived at its site of stimulation, while the other frequencies continue. And that highest frequency has already started its pathway, its, its journey down the auditory pathway. The other frequencies haven't even reached their site of stimulation yet. So the next highest frequency reaches its site of stimulation and uh, starts its travel down the auditory pathway. And then the next um, lowest frequency, the next lowest frequency, and here is the lowest frequency, finally reaches its place on the bezel membrane. And now they're all started down their path towards the inferior colliculus. The high frequency gets there first. And look. Wave five starts for um, wave, st wave five starts uh, for the highest frequency already. Though the, the lowest frequency is nowhere near it, and if it keeps on going, we end up with something like this. Okay, an asynchronous type of firing. That's the click. All right. Now I'm going to change this to show you what happens uh, when we use a chirp instead of the click in the chirp. All right, so now our stimulus is a chirp instead of a click, and as I uh, kind of step through it, we see what happens is the low frequencies are going in now. They're starting their trip down the, uh, down the cochlea. And they're given a chance to get to where they're going, or get partially halfway to where they're going, before the next higher set of frequencies comes in. And this is, this is timed just right. And now the next highest set of frequencies comes in, and now the next and the next. So that once everything is there, you know, notice that 
they've all reached their point of excitation all at the same time. All right? They all fire at the same time. They all start heading down the auditory uh, nervous system at the same time. And they all arrive at the inferior colliculus, the generator of wave 5, at the same time. So, wave 5s are all generated simultaneously. They line up. And so, the final waveform, which is the addition of all of those, is twice as robust of a wave 5 than we had when we had the click. So I hope I uh, have been able to demonstrate with that uh, the efficacy, just, just how that works um, in overcoming the timing problem within the cochlea. Okay? So what's the difference between the chirp and the click? Well, um, the similarities are that they are both broadband stimulations. They both have the same spectrum of frequencies. And they have the same intensity, the same calibration. Okay? The difference is uh, in the timing of the cochlear stimulation, right? It's a more efficient timed stimulation. Uh, uh, and it produces double the response. Okay? And we, and we, that's an advantage to us. When we can produce a higher amplitude response, we can get it faster because we have to do much less averaging. Remember that Jay Hall said once that uh, an ABR response is like a needle in a haystack. And in order to find it and, and end up with something that we can analyze, uh, we have to get rid of the haystack. The haystack is the physiological noise from the patient. Uh, even when the patient is still and relaxed, or even sedated, there is still a lot of other physiological things going on uh, that overwhelm this response, which at best is a half a microvolt, one half of one millionth of a volt. So, uh, the noise overwhelms it, the other physiological noise. And so, we have to average and keep averaging sample after sample after sample. And what we hope will happen is that, that through averaging, the other noises, which are not time-locked with the stimulus, they will uh, kind of average themselves out because they're random. But the actual response, time-locked to the stimulus, will remain because it's not random. Well, and that's that needle in the haystack. We remove the noise by averaging before we could find the needle. In the case of the chirp stimulus, the needle is now not a needle, it's like a shovel. Okay? So we, have, we can do much less averaging to find it, to get rid of the haystack and find it, because it's so much bigger. All right? So the point is that uh, there are several benefits to using a chirp instead of a click if you're doing a threshold ABR and uh, one of them is saving time. It saves a tremendous amount of time. It can be done in less than half the time it would take otherwise.